The Philosophic Corruption of Physics, Lecture 4. One person mentioned to me after yesterday's class that they felt like I had kicked them in the gut with that Boltzmann story. Um, I sympathize, but I have to admit that was my intention. Uh, it's um, the story I'm telling here is a tragedy, and um, it so it has that element to it. And yesterday's class was, in effect, Act Three of the tragedy that I'm telling here in the course. And we saw that the climax occurred in the 1890s, when physicists capitulated to Kant's view of physics as the science that studies mathematical descriptions of appearances. And the next two classes can be thought of as the resolution of the tragedy, showing what happened to physics after Kantianism took over. Now, I want to start today by clarifying one point that I made at the end of last class. Uh, we got a start into Einstein at the end yesterday, and I explained some of Einstein's philosophic position. Remember that uh, I told you he was a phenomenalist and a nominalist. He shared those two positions with Mach. And then I began to tell you how he differed from Mach philosophically. And the point that I covered at the end yesterday was that Einstein was a rationalist. And remember, I gave you that uh, this remarkable uh, question of Einstein's. Uh, why is it necessary to drag down from the Olympian fields of Plato the fundamental ideas in natural science and attempt to reveal their earthly lineage? Well, maybe I didn't make sufficiently clear uh, in class that Einstein does answer this question that we should do this. In fact, he is, he, so he is not, Einstein did not say experience is irrelevant to physics. What he did say was that theoretical concepts and theories in physics are free inventions of the human mind. We come up with them, we create them independent of experience. But after we create them, we should check them against experience. So he does have that, that one tie to experience still. You can think of this, if you know anything about uh, philosophy of science in the 20th century and you've heard of Karl Popper, um, Karl Popper was greatly influenced by Einstein. Um, so uh, if you're familiar with Popper's view on this issue, Einstein takes a very similar view. OK, um, now in connection with Einstein's rationalism, I wanted to make one more point. Einstein believed in the analytic-synthetic dichotomy, um, which again comes down from Kant. Now this dichotomy results from rationalism. It detaches concepts from percepts and logic from experience. Logic is viewed as a formal game of relating concepts to other concepts. A conclusion proved by logic is true by arbitrary definition. Experience, on the other hand, consists of a stream of appearances that we can never predict with certainty. So <clears throat> Einstein writes in Sidelights on Relativity, quote, as far as the laws of mathematics refer to reality, they are not certain. And as far as they are certain, they do not refer to reality. The logical formal alone forms the subject matter of mathematics, which is not concerned with experience." Unquote. Now this view of mathematics would have seemed bizarre to Newton, who created the calculus as a way of quantitatively describing our observations of matter and its motion. In other words, Newton was motivated by the physics problems he was trying to solve in creating the calculus. And Newton argued that all theories must be rigorously induced from the facts. But Einstein claims that theories in physics and mathematics are free inventions of the human mind created independent of observations. Okay, now that gives you the philosophic basis on which Einstein is now going to erect his physics. So let's go into the physics. <clears throat> 
they're created independent of experience. And then they're related to experience uh, um, in terms of the theory's predictions have to conform with experience. But he did not think you could induce the theories from experience. Okay, so now let me get a start on relativity theory, which is the main thing we're going to cover today. Now, in essence, relativity theory is the extension of Newton's laws of motion to the domain of high speeds near the speed of light and the modification of Newton's physics that is necessary when one discards the idea of absolute space. Okay, this is the valid basis of relativity theory. Relativity theory does two things um, that, that needed to be done to extend classical physics properly. First, it, uh, it extends Newton's laws of motion to the domain of high speeds. And second, it, gets, um, it makes the modifications to Newton's physics that are necessary when um, one discards Newton's wrong idea of absolute space. All right, now let's look at some of the highlights of Einstein's theory. And I want to start with a surprising fact, which is the speed of light is always measured to be the same value, regardless of how the light source and the observer are moving with respect to one another. Now that is not what one would expect. Other things don't behave in that strange way. For example, if I toss a ball to you at 20 miles an hour, now, and I'm, if I'm stationary with respect to you, the ball comes to you at 20 miles an hour. But if I toss it to you from the window of my car, and the car is moving at 40 miles an hour toward you, then you will receive the ball at 60 miles an hour, right? Okay, the speed of the ball is the speed of the source plus the speed of the ball relative to the source. Okay? Now consider the example of sound. Sound is a periodic vibration of air molecules, a wave propagating through the air. Now its speed is determined by the properties of the air. It travels at a constant speed relative to the air. The speed relative to you will vary depending on how you're moving with respect to the air. Now light doesn't behave in that way or it doesn't seem to. No matter how the light source is moving, no matter how you're moving, you will always measure the same speed of light relative to you. Now how would a rational physicist attempt to explain that strange result? Now, in essence, I think there's two possible ways. And I'll describe both of them to you briefly here. First, one could say that the speed of light only appears to be constant relative to us. It is actually constant relative to the medium through which light travels. Okay, so on this view, light is like sound. It travels at a constant speed relative to the medium through which it propagates. In this case, the medium is called the ether. Now the difference is that unlike the air, the motion through the ether affects our measuring instruments in such a way that we always measure the same speed for the speed of light. You get that? In other words, this approach is, well, light is actually like sound. It travels at a constant speed relative to some medium, the ether, through which it's propagating. But when we measure that speed, if our instruments are moving in the ether, it affects the instruments in such a way that we always measure the same speed of light. Okay, now that was the first approach taken to explain the apparently constant speed of light relative to observers. A Danish physicist named Heinrich Lorentz developed a somewhat plausible theory that explained the measured constant speed in just that way. Now, based on his theory, Lorentz actually derived the fundamental equations of relativity theory before Einstein did. Okay, so Lorentz did his work prior to Einstein's first paper on relativity, which was in 1905. 
Now, physicists claim today that Lorentz's ether hypothesis had to be rejected because it was arbitrary. They argue that because the properties of the ether are such that it is impossible to detect motion through it in any direct way, the ether is therefore unobservable and the assertion that it exists is arbitrary. But this is a positivist view of the arbitrary. The theory is regarded as arbitrary because the effects of the ether are not directly observable. Actually, you can think of this as uh, somewhat similar to the argument that Mach used to reject atoms. Um, now, Lorentz, Lorentz's theory, in my view, is not arbitrary. He did offer reasons for believing in the ether, particularly uh, reasons based on the theory of electromagnetism, for which there's an abundance of evidence. So the Lorentzian type of ether theory may be wrong, but it can't simply be dismissed as arbitrary as today's physicists do. Okay, now second possible way to explain the constant speed of light. One could take the view that the speed of light really is always the same with respect to the observer. And it's not an apparent effect as Lorentz uh, tried to uh, explain it. Um, the speed of light really is always the same with respect to the observer because the observer or his instruments physically affect the received light. Okay, now on this view, matter physically affects the ether in its vicinity. And the state of that ether determines the speed of light impinging on the matter. Therefore, all observers and their instruments will measure the same speed of light simply because the light reaching them is riding on the ether conditioned by them. Now, a theory of this general type has recently been proposed by a physicist named Lewis Little. Now, this may sound like an odd idea, but there's nothing uh, that rules it out on philosophic grounds or a priori in Kant's way of terms. Yeah. <clears throat> On this view, rather than trying to, see, remember, Lorentz tried to explain the constant measured speed of light as, um, in effect, an artifact based on uh, the motion through the ether affecting our instruments. Okay, so it wasn't, a, it wasn't that the speed of light really is constant with respect to the observer. In this second approach, it is. The speed of light is claimed to really be constant with respect to the observer, but only because the observer or his instruments physically affect the, the light that they receive. There is an effect of the, the matter um, making up you as an observer or the matter of your instruments on the ether in its vicinity. The light, in effect, rides on that ether that your instruments receive and therefore um, is always travels at a constant speed relative to those instruments. Brian? Um, well, that's, that's a little uh, um, different. That, is, that was more of a variation on the Lorentz idea, I think. Um, but the only theory that I know of that has really been worked out and falls into this general category is, is Lewis Little's theory. And I may not actually be describing the theory in exactly the... I'm trying to avoid... Lewis Little's specific terminology here. So, um, but in essence, what I what I just said is a a correct explanation of his basic idea. Yes. Did you have a question? No, I'm talking about what Lewis Little calls his theory of elementary waves. Um, I'm just, I regard his, what he calls his elementary waves as a type of ether, a much different type of ether than um, the 19th century ethers. But if you take ether in the broadest sense as, you know, the physical stuff um, that exists between ponderable bodies of matter, then this is an ether. Okay, now, if interpreted broadly enough, 
it seems to me that these two approaches exhaust the possibilities. Either light really does travel at the same speed relative to the observer because of some physical effect of the observer on the light, or it only appears to do so because of some physical effect of the ether on the instruments. I can't think of another type of physical explanation. So in that sense, these two approaches cover the field. Now, which of these two approaches do you think Einstein took? Neither. Good answer. I actually didn't think you'd fall for a sucker question like that. Um, ask yourself the following question instead. What approach would you take if your goal were merely a mathematical description of the appearances and you were a rationalist? Well, first, you would not look for a physical explanation for the constant speed of light. You are interested in appearances, not in any alleged reality behind them. Second, theories are not induced from observation. They are free inventions of the human mind. So the theorist is free to start wherever he likes. Accordingly, Einstein starts by adopting as a postulate that the speed of light is the same for all observers, regardless of their motion relative to the source. Now, by calling it a postulate, Einstein meant that we should accept it as a primary, an irreducible fact about the appearances that requires no physical explanation. So from the outset, we can see that Einstein's approach is fundamentally Kantian. He begins by rejecting physical explanations and restricting himself to the appearances. Now next, Einstein deduces his theory from this postulate. In particular, he deduces the spatial and temporal properties of the appearances as seen by observers in uniform motion with respect to one another. He finds that for the speed of light to be the same for all observers, lengths must be shorter and time intervals longer for moving observers. Now this is the famous length contraction and time dilation of relativity theory. In other words, for the speed of light to always be constant with respect to every observer, Einstein just simply distorts space and time um, for moving observers. He says um, space contracts and time dilates. Now Einstein derives a set of equations that describe the relationships between the length and time measurements of observers who are in relative motion. Now these are called the Lorentz transformation equations. As I mentioned earlier, Lorentz derived these equations before Einstein on the basis of a theory quite different from Einstein's. Now there's nothing wrong with these equations. They're correct. Let me repeat that. There's nothing wrong with these equations. The equations follow from the premise that all observers measure the same speed of light. Any theory that accepts that premise will agree with these equations. Now this is an important and often misunderstood point. The equations can be right and yet the theory fundamentally wrong. A theory is not merely a set of equations. It is also an interpretation of those equations. And it shouldn't surprise you that a physicist who accepts the basic premises of Kant will arrive at a much different interpretation than a physicist who accepts, say, the basic premises of Ayn Rand. Now, now that doesn't mean that, for, for example, when I, when I said that the equations um, have to be distinguished from the interpretation and two very different theories can have the same equations, now, that doesn't mean that if you pursue those two theories that they won't ultimately lead to different equations. They will, eventually. Um, but at any given point, you know, where you haven't reached omniscience, um, you have a limited set of equations. That limited set of equations can be uh, shared by physical theory, theories that are quite different. Um, so a theory is not equivalent to a set of equations. And relativity provides a perfect illustration of this. 
I want to describe for you two interpretations of the equations relating length and time measurements of different observers. And first, let me uh, briefly discuss Einstein's subjective interpretation of these uh, length and time equations. On this view, the equations relate the appearances of different observers. The length of an object or the time interval between events is defined relative to the observer and varies depending on how the observer is moving. Okay, so, up on the board I've written uh, the equations for length contraction and time dilation. And let's take the length contraction equation first. L is the length measured by an observer traveling at speed v with respect to the object that he's measuring the length of. Okay, L0, L sub 0, is the length that an observer that is, who is stationary with respect to the object would measure. That's called the rest length. Now, the length measured by the moving observer is equal to the rest length multiplied by this factor, um, the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, where c is the speed of light, v is the speed of the observer with respect to the object. Now notice that this quantity in square root is always less than 1. So the length measured by the moving observer will always be less than the length he would have measured had he been stationary with respect to the object. That's why it's called length contraction. For the moving observer, lengths contract. Phil? Well, less than zero. Right, right. Um, but the, it turns out that the observer can't actually move at the speed of light. So. Right. Oh, right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Okay, now we have a similar uh, equation for time. Um, and again, uh, T here is the time that the moving observer measures between two events. Um, T0 is the time that the observer would have measured had he been stationary with respect to those two events. And the equation says that t equals t0 divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared here. So the time measured by the moving observer will always be greater than the time between the events measured uh, by the observer at rest with respect to the events. That's why it's called time dilation. Now, on Einstein's subjective interpretation, there is no such thing as the actual length of an object. There is only length for you and length for me. Every object in this, for every object in the universe, the length for me changes as I move around this room. So as, as I walk in this direction, things shrink um, in the direction that I'm walking. So you look thinner to me. Um, as I uh, walk across this room, well, you would if I could walk a little faster, but uh, I'd, have to, I'd have to walk, say, 100,000 uh, miles per second, but, um, which is rare, but um, you get the idea. Um, for a moving observer, lengths contract, so you all get thinner. Now, to, to put this in objectivist terms, this subjective interpretation of Einstein's makes no attempt to distinguish form from object. There is only that great Kantian package deal, the subjective appearance. Now, many years ago, when I first studied the theory of relativity, I experienced a feeling of disorientation. Uh, this was well before I had any real understanding of objectivism. At the time, I simply thought that the theory was beyond my ability to grasp. So I just learned how to use the equations so that I could pass the exams. And I discovered I could be very confused and still get good grades on exams. I think this disorientation is very common among young students um, of relativity. 
the students are implicitly on the primacy of existence premise. Suddenly, when they get to Einstein's theory, there's no longer one reality. There is only the various perspectives of the different observers. The student is no longer asked to compute real properties, but to calculate how the appearances of one observer compare to the appearances of another. There are as many worlds as there are observers. Now that is disorienting. And, well, I could, I could tell you stories about how I think this aspect of Einstein's theory, this subjectivism in Einstein's theory, um, prevents even professional physicists from really understanding the theory and being able to work with it well. I mean, I actually had a professor that gave us a test on relativity theory, and after we turned our tests in, he, he gave us his answer sheets, um, and he missed half the problems. Now, this was a fairly well-known professional physicist. Um, now, they were tricky problems, but it go it it's an indication that Physicists have no, um, they know they can't rely on their common sense when they're dealing with relativity theory, and so they find it difficult to think about. Okay, now let me give you an example of what I would consider an objective interpretation of Einstein's equations. The equations are open to the exact opposite interpretation that Einstein gives them. For example, according to the type of approach taken by Lewis Little, Einstein's equations tell you how to distinguish form from object. They tell you how to subtract away the effects of your motion and delays in signal propagation in order to compute the proper lengths of objects and time intervals between events. Now, your motion relative to an object affects your measurement of its length. Now, why is that according to Lewis Little's theory? Well, in order to compute the length, you must measure the positions of the two ends of the object at the same time. But how do you know you've measured them at the same time? You have to account for the time delay in the propagation of the light you are using to measure the object. And to do that, you have to account for the fact that the speed of the light you receive is affected by your motion. So, and th these equations of Einstein's on this interpretation tell you exactly how to do that. That's the meaning of the equations. To separate form from object so that you can actually compute the length you would have measured had you not been moving with respect to the object and the time interval between events that you would have measured had you not been at motion. In other words, you're simply subtracting out the effects of your motion. Now, it's obvious that the object itself does not change whenever you decide to move. If your motion affects the measurements, your measurements of the object, those effects should be abstracted away to get the actual properties of the object. Einstein's equations tell you how to do that. He just doesn't interpret them from that primacy of, uh, primacy of, of existence perspective. Now, as a simple um, analogy here, consider an observer who sees lightning strike about a mile away. He then hears the thunder about five seconds later. If he focused only on his perception, he could say that the thunder happened five seconds after the lightning. Of course, the timing will vary depending on the observer's distance from the event. But if we know that the thunder and lightning originated from the same one event, <clears throat> we can compensate for the slower speed of sound and actually derive that all observers will agree that both the light and the sound originated at the same time. So we can view the equations of relativity in, in a similar way. They allow us to compensate for the effects of our motion and the delays in light signal propagation in order to compute the actual lengths and actual time intervals. Everybody clear on length contraction and time dilation? Not at all, huh? Do you have a question, Daryl? Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I wonder if you're misunderstanding some of the math. I thought that, it, well, first of all, Little is accepting those same equations, right? Absolutely, as did Lorentz. All three theories agree with these equations. But I thought that L, the, the solution you got, was going to vary depending on your speed as the observer. Yeah, it does. This V is the observer's speed relative to the object. So how is it that, I, what I'm having trouble understanding is that I thought that on Lewis's approach, everyone should reach the conclusion the length of the object is the same. Yes. So where, but then obviously L is not referring to the length of the object, or are they all going to get Right, exactly. That's what, that, that's the difference. Um, the L on Einstein's theory, L refers to the, the length of the appearance. Right. On, on Little's theory, it refers to the length that you will measure if you are moving at speed v with respect to the object. Is that cleared up? What is little, what is little then? What would little say is the length of the object? L sub zero? He would, I believe he would agree with me in saying that the, the length of the object is L0. And what you've done, what this equation allows you to do, in effect, is relate your measurement to the actual length of the object. Okay. Yeah, um, Phil. There is another, I, I, and I don't know if this is what Little Surrey predicts, but there is another actual interpretation of that, that is that if V is the uh, speed at which an object is moving, that that L is actually the contracted length of that object yeah. at speed V. And, yeah. and in fact, I mean, with radioactive decay and, and time dilation, I mean, it, it's not just an appearance, that thing really yeah. is slowing down internally. Well, let me, let me address that. Um, actually, this was a little later in my notes, but um, I can answer it now. Um, the question is, isn't, it, uh, isn't there a theory which regards this length contraction and time dilation as real um, physical effects? Um, that is true. When I gave my objective interpretation of relativity theory, um, these, these equations, remember I preface it by saying um, this is the interpretation that I believe follows from uh, Lewis Little's type approach to relativity theory. On the Lorentzian approach, this length contraction is real. The object really does contract. Um, now, due to a motion through the ether, now this is this V is no longer interpreted as the velocity of the observer, but rather the velocity through the ether. So if you have an ether theory such that uh, ether actually affects the lengths of objects, that's possible, that's one possible approach. Um, I don't rule that out. Then this length contraction equation actually has a physical meaning. It has no physical meaning in Einstein's theory. Okay, let me, uh, let me go on now um, to, there, I'll, I'll pause for questions again on relativity theory when I get to the end. Um, but let me go on now to the, the concept, the next idea in relativity theory that I want to talk about, which is relativistic mass. Length and time are not the only quantities given a subjective interpretation in Einstein's theory. He also treats mass in a similar way. And now I want to explain to you why I think Einstein's concept of relativistic mass is wrong. Um, a teaser at the outset. Uh, this is a radical view that I'm taking here. Um, you've all no doubt heard of Einstein's famous equation relating energy and mass, E equals mc squared. Well, I'm going to tell you why I think Einstein's theory provides no valid justification for that equation. So this is brazen heresy. Okay, let's start at the beginning. Newton defined the momentum of an object as its mass multiplied by its velocity. 
Uh, momentum is usually referred to uh, in physics by the symbol P. So I've written on the board P equals mass times velocity. Now, why did Newton define the momentum in that way? In other words, why is this particular function of mass and velocity worth conceptualizing? Now, we have no concept for, uh, for example, mass multiplied by velocity cubed. Why do we have one for mass multiplied by velocity? Well, the answer is because this particular function of mass and velocity is conserved. That means, in the absence of external forces, the total momentum of a system of bodies, re bodies remains constant, no matter how the bodies interact. The system can go through all sorts of changes. The velocities of the bodies can change. Their masses can even change if they break up or explode. But even so, the total momentum of the system always remains constant. Now, that is a very powerful principle of physics. And therefore, the concept of momentum is absolutely essential. However, it turns out that Newton's expression for the momentum does not apply at speeds approaching the speed of light. We have to modify his equation. The function of mass and velocity that is conserved, rather than being mass time, simply mass times velocity, is mass times velocity divided by square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, uh, where c is the speed of light. So I've written, that's this, uh, this second equation. The momentum, rather than equaling mass times velocity, at high speeds, it is found experimentally that the, quant the function of mass and velocity that is conserved is mass times velocity divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Now, that is not a problem. Um, we just have a new expression for the momentum that's accurate at all speeds, rather than just speeds much lower than the speed of light. The problem arises because Einstein decides to keep Newton's original equation for the momentum. According to Einstein, momentum equals mass times velocity still. And Einstein simply defines a new concept for mass, relativistic mass, which is related to the old concept of mass, which I've denoted by m sub, no, sub zero, by this equation. It's the relativistic mass equals m sub, zero, m sub zero divided by the square root of one minus v squared over c squared. Now, you might say that this amounts to the same thing. Um, if you substitute the equation for relativistic mass into the momentum equation, you get just this um, equation for the momentum that I, I said. So what's the big deal? Um, if we combine Einstein's two equations, we get the right expression for the momentum. It's just a matter of definition, and definitions are arbitrary. Except that, as objectivists, we know that definitions are not arbitrary. And there is no justification in Einstein's theory for this new definition of mass. Now, in classical physics, mass referred to an intrinsic property of an object. But in Einstein's new definition, it doesn't. It is now a concept of motion, a concept that refers to a relation rather than isolating a property of the thing. On Einstein's view, if I decide to move across the room, your mass increases for me. Now, due to length contraction, you also get thinner. So this is the ultimate contradiction in relativity, right? As I move across the room, you get thinner and heavier at the same time. Don't, don't take that as my, uh, my serious criticism. That was a joke. <clears throat> So, just as with length and time, Einstein defines mass in a subjective way. Relativistic mass is not a property of real objects. The same object has one mass for you and another mass for me, assuming we are in motion relative to each other. 
So again, Einstein is doing the physics of appearances, not of reality. Now the idea of relativistic mass has its roots in Kant's subjectivism. It also has specific roots in Kant's physics, which reduced matter to forces and motion. So Einstein has taken what was an intrinsic property of a body, and he's turned it into a concept of motion. Now remember Kant's um, insistence on the primacy of action over entity. And there was a whole progression in 19th century physics um, that culminated in a school that I didn't have time to tell you about, which is the, the school of energetics. Now, the advocates of energetics uh, argued that energy was actually the primary concept in physics, not matter. Um, and this was another form of the primacy of action over entities. So, the... Uh, it's possible to identify a long development from Kant that led to Einstein's idea of equating mass with energy. Now, it's interesting to note how physicists have reacted to the concept of relativistic mass. If Einstein's concept were a valid extension of Newton's, then physicists should be able to replace the old concept with the new one. But this is not what has happened. Physicists need a concept of mass that names an actual physical property of the body. So they retain the old concept, which they now call rest mass. And in fact, whenever physicists use the concept of mass in any important way, um, they're really referring to the classical concept, which they now call rest mass. Um, relativity, Einstein's relativity theory can actually be developed... Uh, um, very easily without this concept of relativistic mass at all. In fact, I have one textbook at home that does that. Um, so let me just finish the point that I teased you with at the beginning of this section. Um, Einstein gave no valid justification for the equation E equals mc squared. The m in that equation is his relativistic mass. And since he gave no justification for that concept, Einstein's equation should actually be written um, similarly to the way that I think this momentum equation should be written. Uh, in other words, energy equals mass times c squared divided by 1 minus v squared over C squared. Um, well, but in my, uh, since, since I don't accept uh, relativistic mass, m always means m0 in my, um, <coughs> um, so, I mean, rather than absorbing this velocity term into the mass, uh, um, which Einstein gives no physical reason for, um, it should be um, kept separate from the mass and mass should remain an intrinsic property of body. Now, I want to, uh, it came up uh, a little earlier with Phil's question about uh, the interpretation of length, contraction, and time dilation. Um, couldn't these length, contraction, and time dilations be considered real effects? Um, and I need to make a similar point in regard to mass here, that I'm not saying it's not possible to develop a physical theory in which you would actually give physical reasons why masses change as the bodies move, say, through the ether. Um, that kind of physical theory is possible, and in fact, that's the, the that kind of theory that Lorentz was developing. What I am saying is that there's no justification for this concept in the context of Einstein's theory. Um, it may be possible to validate such concepts on the basis of a, Lor a Lorentzian ether type approach, but considered as appearances, these are invalid concepts. Phil. I totally disagree with about that. I think of all the experimental things that go on now with particle accelerators is the relativistic mass that's the most experimentally shown in certain sense because as they um, 
accelerating around in the rays, the energy of these particles, um, and then the particle, the actual ponderable particle, if you all in your philosophic sense you used, the ponderable mass that comes out of the collision is like the creation of electrons and protons and other particles that come out of two particles, energy, moving energy being converted back into mass conforms precisely to mc squared divided by 1 minus b squared mc squared according to the v's. Right, so I understand. I, Bill was making the point that uh, there is an abundance of experimental evidence um, validating these equations. Um, um, but what I say is there's an abundance of experimental evidence validating the equation that momentum equals mass times velocity divided by 1 minus v squared over c squared. You're always measuring in those experiments momentum or energy. There is no direct measurement of mass um, in, in those experiments. So, I mean, if you could show me an experiment where you were not measuring momentum, not measuring energy, you were directly measuring mass as distinct from momentum and energy, and you could show that the mass of a body varied in this way, then I'm, uh, I'm open to considering that as evidence for a Lorentzian type ether theory that would explain this kind of relativistic mass. But there, there is, to my knowledge, no such experiment that has direct um, experimental validation of Einstein's equation for relativistic mass. And given the fact that all those experiments measure momentum and energy, the only thing you have evidence for are these equations and nothing within the theory that justifies the new concept of mass. The particles, the particles that weren't there before coming out of seemingly the energy of motion of two other particles is evidence of oh, mass. Phil was bringing up the issue of particle creation in uh, accelerators. What I think that is evidence for is that mass is not an irreducible property, that mass is a can be thought of as a form of internal energy. But that is still an intrinsic property of the, uh, of the body. Um, and it does not justify making mass into a, uh, um, a property, um, a concept of, of motion with respect to other bodies. Okay, let me uh, move on um, and tell you about... Uh, one other aspect of relativity theory. And this is a very fundamental idea in relativity, uh, what Einstein called the principle of relativity. In contrast to the concept of relativistic mass, the principle of relativity is in essence valid. However, Einstein's philosophic ideas led him to formulate it in a way that I think obscures its meaning. So I want to offer a reformulation of Einstein's basic principle. Now Einstein states that the principle of relativity <coughs> is as follows. Quote, the laws of physics are invariant under arbitrary coordinate system transformation. Unquote. Now I know that non-physicists are not accustomed to talk about coordinate system transformation, so let me state the principle in the way that it is often presented to laymen. The laws of physics are the same for all observers. The laws of physics are the same for all observers. Now this principle almost states a crucial basic truth, but I think it misses the mark. And let me explain why. First, it should strike you as odd that we have a basic principle of physics that does not refer to matter and motions, but instead refers to mathematical laws. Physics shouldn't study, I mean, excuse me, physics should study physical entities, not mathematical laws. The laws express the reality, but they shouldn't substitute for it. But maybe we shouldn't be surprised after all. Kant and Mach defined physics as the math ma mathematical description of appearances. Their focus was on mathematical laws and observers. Physical reality was left out. And again, we can see Kant's influence here in Einstein's formulation of the relativity principle. 
Now, how should the principle be formulated? Well, this is what I came up with. The motions of physical entities depend only on their properties and relationships, not on the coordinate system chosen by us. I'll repeat that. The motions of physical entities depend only on their properties and relationships, not on the coordinate system chosen by us. Now this, I think, captures the physical meaning of the relativity principle. And it also makes obvious why the principle is true. In this formulation, it is a corollary of the primacy of existence. The relativity principle says, we can't affect the actual physics merely by describing the entities from a different perspective. The motions are determined by the entities and their relationships, which are independent of and unaffected by optional choices in our mode of description. Okay, the physics is the state of the matter out there and its relationships. That can't change when we change our perspective on it, our optional mode of describing it. Now, it's worth noting here that relativity is a bad name for this principle. Einstein thought of the principle as intimately connected to the rejection of absolute space. Newton thought that space existed independent of matter, and therefore there was a correct coordinate system, the system that was fixed with respect to absolute space. Einstein properly rejected this view and claimed that the choice of coordinate system is optional. It shouldn't affect the physics. So the principle was named relativity because Einstein's focus was polemical. He denied absolute motion through absolute space and instead regarded all motion as relative, hence the name relativity. But if we drop that polemical perspective, and examine the positive content of the principle, I think a better name would be invariance of reality principle, or invariance principle for short. Uh, notice that the connotations are quite different from relativity principle. Did it, any, everybody get that point? Okay. Um, now I should also mention that my formulation doesn't have quite the same implications as Einstein's is usually said to have. For example, the Lorentzian ether theory is regarded as inconsistent with Einstein's principle, but it is consistent with my principle of relativity. Um, now, I think that's a big point in my favor because I don't think that Lorentz's theory should be rejected on the basis of the relativity principle. Um, it may be possible to prove the Lorentzian theory wrong, but you can't simply dismiss it on the basis of this kind of a principle. Now, the relativity principle is enormously useful in physics. Uh, Einstein used it to show that Newton's theory of gravitation was incomplete. It turns out that if one rejects Newton's idea of absolute space, then Newton's theory of gravitation violates the relativity principle. You can define different coordinate systems in which your physical predictions will actually be different. Um, for example, um, if you choose a coordinate system that is fixed with respect to the distant stars, um, such that the stars don't rotate in this coordinate system, then Newton's theory explains the planetary orbits perfectly. On the other hand, if you pick a coordinate system that rotates with the Earth in its orbit around the Sun, then you predict that the Earth will crash into the Sun. Now, since that doesn't happen, something is missing from the theory. And it was Einstein who worked out a theory of gravitation that satisfies the relativity principle. Now, just as a clarifying thought on this, um, Newton was well aware of this. Um, and this was, in effect, his argument for absolute space. I mean, he knew that he needed absolute space in his physics. His physics was not consistent without it. And... Um, but if you dismiss the idea of absolute space, then you have to modify Newton's physics. 
And it was Einstein was the one that worked out the modification of Newton's theory of gravitation. Now that was probably Einstein's greatest accomplishment, although he also made important contributions to atomic physics. But even in this area, even in uh, the theory of gravitation, Einstein's false philosophic views undercut this achievement of his. His gravitational theory is extremely unphysical. Forces are not propagated by any physical means. In fact, according to Einstein's interpretation, there is no such thing as a gravitational force. He replaces forces with the geometrical properties of space. Now, many rationalists throughout history, from Plato through Descartes, dreamed of reducing matter to geometry. Einstein's theory can be said to follow in this tradition. Rather than trying to develop a theory in which some kind of physical substance propagates forces and fills space, Einstein speaks of space. He treats it as if it were a physical thing. His equations are interpreted as describing the, quote, curvature of space. So the equations constitute a brilliant extension of Newton's theory. But the interpretation is completely unphysical and rationalistic. Okay, well, I need to wrap up relativity theory now so I can move on to quantum mechanics. Now, what is wrong with relativity theory? Well, in essence, it is a theory of appearances, not a theory of the physical world. Einstein's genius was that he integrated physics with philosophy, specifically integrating concepts such as length, time, and mass with the prevailing Kantian philosophy. If one accepts Kant's premise that physics merely offers mathematical descriptions of the phenomenal world, then Einstein's theory makes perfect sense. It makes sense to accept the constant speed of light without physical explanation and just derive the equations that describe the appearances, apparent lengths, apparent times, apparent masses, all defined relative to the observer. As presented in physics textbooks, Einstein's theory is an enormous non sequitur. It doesn't follow from the facts or the equations that correctly model the facts. It follows only if we add a premise, a premise that's taken for granted in the 20th century and therefore left unstated. It is Kant's premise that science deals only with appearances, not with reality, which is unknowable. If we grant that, Einstein's interpretation of the equation follows. So the revolution that overthrew classical physics was Kant's Copernican revolution. It took a little more than a hundred years. In the 17th century, Cardinal Bellarmino lost his battle to declare reality off limits to scientists. But led by Kant, his view is staged a comeback and triumphed in the 20th century. If there were an afterlife, the cardinal would be laughing now. Okay, that completes what I have to say about relativity theory. Are there any questions? Um, Daryl. I, I thought you said at the beginning that Lorenz took the view that the constant, constant the speed of light was um, just just um, the way it appeared to us. Right. I'm a little confused by how that relates to what you were referring to later as the Lorentzian theory that there's some physical uh, impact well, yeah. on the length yeah. of things yeah. in the map. Well, I mean, no matter which way you, no matter which approach you take, um, there will be some aspect of the theory that you explain um, as, uh, as a, in essence, part of the form and an appearance and some aspect that will be real. Now, in the Lorentzian approach, the length contraction is real, but the constant speed of light that we measure, it, that's the way the light appears to us. And the reason I, I mentioned when I, when I talked about Lorentz's uh, explanation for why we always measure the same speed of light, I I stated it very generally. I said, well, motion through the ether affects our instruments. Well, 
This is the way it affects our instrument. Um, the, the length contraction, for example, is regarded as real. And our instruments actually contract if they move through the ether. And that's producing this effect that we always measure the same speed of light. Right. Yes? Can you give an example of some other um, observation that leads to these um, considerations with regard to mass and uh, momentum? I, I can see that oh. you're talking about the direct observation of the speed of light, the measurement of the speed of light. Right. What, what physical or what directly observable what? phenomena yeah. relate to these other equations? Yeah. What, um, these equations for, uh, the relativistic equations for momentum and energy, say, uh, the question is, what, uh, what observations do we have uh, that validate these equations? Um, and it all comes from the field of particle physics, because notice that, or for the most part, particle physics. I mean, you could, uh, um, rockets and satellites, uh, um, there are small relativistic corrections that are uh, relevant. But the, I mean, notice that the whole, it, these equations, um, the difference between the relativistic equations and the classical equations is going to be extremely small until you get up to speeds close to the speed of, uh, comparable to the speed of light. And so it's all, they're, you're only going to see these effects uh, in very fast moving objects, which is why um, for example, one of the main sources of experimental data validating these equations is in particle accelerators, for instance, where they take subatomic particles of matter and accelerate them to enormous speeds. And certainly, though all those experiments and, and millions have been done uh, in the 20th century um, confirm these momentum and energy equations. Um, yes. So, uh, how is it that those, I mean, I think I know the answer to it, but, uh, they're observed by tracks and cloud chain. Oh, right, right. I mean, there, there are several different uh, methods for um, observing the particles in these, uh, um, in these high speed particle accelerators. Uh, bubble chambers, uh, um, Synchronization detectors. I mean, there's about three or four different methods that they use uh, to actually observe uh, the momentum and energy of these particles. Brian, it was um, the first to come up with this equation at the bottom. Was that something original from you, or did you find that somewhere else? What this? Yeah. Um, well, that's. I I mean, this. No, don't don't give me credit for this uh, original equation. The as a mathematical function that's easily derivable from the rest. I'm just curious. Were you the first one to? You know? My my only contribution to this, um, and I don't even think I'm alone on this point. Um, but um, my the only thing you could possibly call my contribution to this is my rejection of this concept of relativistic mass. Um, and my insistence. I mean, what follows from that is my insistence of actually explicitly including these velocity terms in these equations rather than absorbing them into the mass. Um, now, I don't think, and I'm not even alone on that point. For example, there is a, um, I mean, there are other objectivist physicists who, uh, who realize that on Einstein's theory, um, he gives no physical justification for this concept of relativistic mass. And, and like I said, I even have a textbook um, written by a physicist who, as far as I know, is pretty much in the mainstream. Um, and he doesn't reject the concept of philosophic, I mean, on the, of relativistic mass on philosophic grounds, but he just points out that it doesn't serve much of a purpose in the theory, so he doesn't use it in his book. Um, uh, no. Um, Feynman, unfortunately, is an, what was an a-philosophical pragmatist. Um, now, I hate to describe him that way, almost, because I like the guy. Um, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for him as a physicist. But 
he he is of no help um, in straightening out the <clears throat> conceptual foundations of 20th century physics. In fact, he even used to tell his students, and I think this is really sad, I mean, here's the greatest physicist in the country um, at the time of his prime. He used to tell his students, don't waste your time thinking about these paradoxes in quantum theory uh, because the questions don't really have answers and you'll just waste your career. Um, so just accept it and move on. Uh, so it, his, uh, and Feynman absolutely disdained philosophers. Now you can understand his, I mean I remember the Boltzmann quote that I read to you yesterday about how Boltzmann felt about philosophy. Um, and Boltzmann was really, of course, referring to 19th century German philosophy, 18th to 19th century German philosophy. But, you know, Feynman had met a lot of philosophers of science, 20th century philosophers of science. And as a result, he just rejected the whole field of philosophy. But he confused philosophy with 20th century philosophy, unfortunately. Okay, now I want to at least make a start into quantum mechanics today because otherwise we'll have too much to cover tomorrow. So, um, take a deep breath and uh, I'll at least give you an introduction today. And I want to start by telling you about the historical development of quantum theory as this history is told by physicists today. Now the so-called history that physicists believe is so absurd that I've decided to present it to you as a fairy tale, which it is. Fairy tales are sometimes read to children at night until they go to sleep. Well, this fairy tale serves the same purpose. It has put physicists to sleep for the past 70 years. Here it is. Once upon a time, there was a land of happy physicists. They were happy because they made rapid progress in understanding the world around them. Above all, they were happy because they believed in an intelligible, lawful universe that was entirely open to the human mind, waiting to be discovered. Tragically, this belief turned out to be based on nothing more than naivety and ignorance. One day the physicists began observing the world more carefully, performing more experiments, gathering more facts, and they made the most startling and profound discovery of all time. They discovered that the world is not lawful or intelligible. At the most fundamental level, it is ruled not by causality, but by sheer chance. And this wasn't all. The new experiments proved that the basic constituents of matter don't even exist with specific properties until we observe them. They pop into existence when we measure them. Now, even though these new discoveries were very exciting, the physicists felt sad that their happy predecessors had been wrong. After all, they thought, it would be nice to live in a world of physical things that really existed with definite properties, things that always acted in accordance with their properties. But alas, there is no such world. No matter how much the physicists might wish for it, facts are facts, and the scientific objectivity required them to accept the conclusions that followed from the observations. And the sad truth is that the physical world isn't. It isn't real, it isn't causal, it isn't intelligible. As lovers of truth, the physicists not only had to accept this new discovery, they had to acknowledge it as their crowning achievement and the most profound insight in the history of science. In the end, the physicists all gave each other Nobel Prizes and lived happily ever after. At least they were happy when it, whenever anyone observed them. The rest of the time they remained in an indeterminate state. <laughs> now, that is the official history, as presented in thousands of books and lectures today. Nearly every physics professor in the country believes that fairy tale. One could almost say that believing in it is a prerequisite for getting a job at a university. 
So, is it true? Well, you should be suspicious. Consider the claim that the observed facts have refuted identity. That is, refuted the fact that to be is to be something. And that the observations have refuted causality, the fact that an entity's actions are determined by its nature. Now let's say that we doubt this claim. So we ask the quantum physicist, are you saying you've seen an entity without identity? A something that was nothing in particular? And if you have, what did it look like? Well, the physicist concedes he hasn't actually seen such a thing. He knows they exist, but every time he looks at them, they turn into something specific. His act of observation gives them identity, but they were nothing in particular before he looked. And because of this lack of identity, he is forced, against his will, to renounce causality. The actions of an entity cannot be caused by its nature because it hasn't got one. Now, just to give you your money's worth for this course, I've decided to go out on a limb here. I hereby guarantee you that there are not and never will be any observations that cast any doubt on the ideas of identity and causality. Thank you. I can't be too proud of that, but I consider it self-evident. Every observation is an observation of specific things acting in strict accordance with their specific natures. There's nothing else to observe that exhausts the inventory of the universe. There are no observations, no experimental results that could possibly explain why the physicists who developed quantum theory rejected identity and causality. We can know in advance, without even studying the history, that the rejection was based on false philosophic premises, not on any experiments. Now this conclusion is confirmed when one studies the actual historical development of the theory, rather than simply accepting the fairy tale on faith as most phys physicists do. And what we find is that, Germany, that German physicists emphatically rejected causality before the development of quantum theory. Okay, well, that, I'm going to uh, have to draw the line here today, um, but that gives you an idea of where I'm going tomorrow. Um, my, I'll start tomorrow by actually following the historical development of quantum theory and showing you what physicists thought of these ideas of identity and causality before the development of quantum theory. Um, and uh, show you that their rejection of those ideas had nothing whatever to do with experiments. Um, so that will, that's our agenda for tomorrow. So we'll close here. This course concludes with Lecture 5.